yeah, we will now turn to a development that is characterized recently as like no others or few others. The shifting and growing role of the state in light of numerous cases. And for that panel, I'm happy to welcome our topic leader, Michael Rauchenstein, who is the SRF news anchor. Swiss people might know him from television. Then Andreas Brandstetter, he's the president of Insurance Europe. Professor Uwe Krüger, the head of EMAA of Temasek from Singapore. And Ricarda Lang, the co-leader of the Green Party and a member of the German Bundestag. Welcome on stage. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for being with us for this session this afternoon. Somebody asked me before if I'm the security guy of our Swiss economic minister, Guy <laughs> Parmela, who will speak later. <laughs> I'm not. I, <laughs> I will lead this discussion uh, this afternoon here at the St. Collins Symposium. And again, thank you very much for being here um, with us. We have um, top speakers here to have a discussion about an issue which was already this morning uh, also discussed in, in other, in other um, topics, the return of the state, a shift in paradigm. Um, a question which is also important at the moment in Switzerland when we think about the Credit Suisse and UBS, but we will uh, talk about this in a few minutes. We will dis discuss um, the role of state also when it comes to the green transformation. How important is the state or is it only by the liberal market um, to, to, um, to be successful with this green transformation? Um, I will introduce the speakers and then we will start with the discussion. So we have uh, Ricardo Long. We already had the pleasure this morning. We had a, a talk uh, with Thierry Burkhardt, the uh, Ständerat of Switzerland, um, this morning in uh, St. Collins Symposium in town. We were speaking about economic stability and climate change. So uh, Ricardo is co-leader of Bündnis 90 Die Grünen, that's the Green Party of Germany, the Greens are in the German government together with the SPD and the FDP. Um, Ricarda is a member of the coalition committee. That means if there are some problems in the government, and um, believe me, there are a lot of problems sometimes, <laughs> <laughs> Ricarda has a very important role and um, we will, uh, we will hear from her also about this uh, during this hour. And her political priorities are climate politics and social justice. Then we have Andreas Brandstetter, president of Insurance Europe. He's the CEO of Unicare Insurance Group. The group operates in 18 European countries, has 16 million customers. Uh, he started his professional career as an employee at the Federal Chancellery of Austria. He was working, among others, for the Austrian Raiffeisen Association in Brussels. So he was uh, living and working in Brussels, and he has also the point of view a bit of the European Union or how the European Union as a supranational organization works, which is also important for our discussion when you think about the Green Deal, for example. And then a warm welcome to Professor Uwe Krüger this afternoon. He is the European Chief of the Singapore Sovereign Wealth Fund, Temasek. Um, Temasek is investing in areas like sustainability and digitalization. He is head of industrial business services, energy and resources of Temasek. Um, the fund is um, acting in 14 global offices. Um, including Singapore, New York, or Beijing. And this afternoon, he's replacing Dilhan Pillai Sandra Zagana, the CEO of Temasek Holding. So also a warm welcome to you, to everybody. You. So 
So we will start a discussion here for about, I think, 30 minutes, and then we will open the discussion, of course, um, also to the audience, to you. So if you have questions um, to our panelists, please uh, remember then them in 30 minutes and uh, take the opportunity to ask your questions to these top speakers. So I mentioned before, in Switzerland, we have a discussion which is really uh, highly political and important for us and also I think for the world because the Credit Suisse, the bank, will be taken over by the UBS and it was the Swiss government who is responsible for this rescue, uh, responsible maybe also that there is not an international financial market crisis that the Swiss government rescued um, the Credit Suisse, um, Uwe Krüger, how important is the role of a state in this case of UBS and Credit Suisse? For those who have uh, listened to uh, Thomas Jordan before, I think you got an impression how careful the considerations were by the SNB and the Swiss government and other stakeholders over this critical weekend. So I think it could be seen that when responsible people come together, the state has a very important role to play to prove to prevent the disaster to happen, which would, would have contagious effects for the whole uh, fin financial system way beyond Switzerland. But I think it's also important to, to realize what are the lessons that could be learned out of the situation that uh, we all witnessed uh, over the last couple of weeks, and not only in Switzerland, but clearly the saga is ongoing in the US, as uh, you will have seen with the regional banks crisis. And I think that Trouble always is when regula regulatory kind of consequences are being drawn, that the regulator typically regulates the sins of the past and not looking into what is the future challenge that a system might be facing. And here, I'd just like to remind you if, you, if you look at the systemic importance of the banking sector, if I take the US example for a moment, um, might be far away, but the regional banks in the U.S. are systemically important to finance the SMEs across the U.S., and this is similar to Switzerland, the backbone of the economy. So as we think about the consequences, we need to realize that um, the dynamic that had become visible here, that in former times when there was a bank run, you had to queue in front of the bank, which was a physical exercise to get to your money. Now it's a couple of clicks. And when kind of confidence wanes, being a specific bank or a class of banks, this kind of spreads in a split second across the continent, across the world. So we need to think when, when the consequences about state regulation uh, are starting now, we need to really think ahead. How has digitization changed the endangers the stability of the banking system going forward? What can we do? Uh, guaranteeing deposits, doing that more intelligently in the future in order to prevent that. And I think it's an excellent example where you can see that an intelligent state that really understands the dynamics of the markets has an important role to play. It did in a crisis management situation, but even more so, now is the time to think systematically about how we secure uh, the banking system of the future with all the innovation that is happening in the sector. Uh, Ricarda, what is your interpretation of the role of the state um, in a case like this? Mm. I think throughout the last years, I have had many discussions, market versus state. And to be rather honest with you, I found most of them really tiring. Because I think it is very clear that when we look at two situations like this, but also transformation situations, when we look at the broader spectrum of what an economy has to do today, the market will not solve it on its own but also the state and the politics will not solve it on own. So I think we have to get away, and I think this is also the shift we are talking about that is already happening also in the minds of many people from this market versus state, but we have to think of a new relationship between state and market, between politics and market. This does not supposed to be politicians thinking they are the better entrepreneurs and not entrepreneurs thinking they are the better politicians. But I think when I look at the situation in Germany, we had under the era of Angela Merkel, who is a very impressive woman and politician, who I have high regards for, but what we have seen is kind of a depolitization of economy politics. 
we were acting as if the decision for Nord Stream 2 was a non-political decision. We were acting as if the decision of blocking the solar industry and then going to China was a non-political decision. But all those were political decisions, and now I think we need to talk about a new relationship between state and markets when we define goals, and then the market uses its power it has to get to these goals, but where politicians don't stand back and act as if it's not political. Mm. Andreas, you are working in the insurance uh, area. How important are states for your business? <clears throat> they are of super high importance. They are frame setters, they define frameworks, they uh, protect stakeholders, clients, if you think about the consumer um, protection agencies. They give us clear goals about how much capital we need to be secure, to pay proper dividends, so stuff like this. So we highly appreciate, uh, in general, the role of the states. Um, in our industry, especially, we are facing just tremendous high standards. So if you talk with global relevant European insurance companies, we often hear the comment that if we compare ourselves to competition in our industry, if it's China, if it's Asia, if it's, um, if it's uh, Americas, that we are super conservative regulated, right? And that by instance, we could set free much more capital and this capital we could transform into productive um, um, in investments in infrastructure, for instance, right? So there's always this, this tit for that, this discussion, but echoing what Ricardo said, I like the approach. I think it's time for a new definition because the really relevant uh, challenges of this world, green transformation, artificial intelligence, we just can solve together, not either as a free market or state. And by the way, the state are all of us. So also government companies from the free markets, to a certain extent, are part of the state. So this sounds really positive, this relationship, a state and a liberal market, but it's not always so positive, I think. A state could also be um, a problem for the liberal market, couldn't it? Could be, uh, but uh, if you would have asked me, like, whatever, 10 years ago, what is the most important role of the state, I would, have, I would have given the same answer, I would assume, of most of us in this room, saying the state should protect, um, beside the fact that it should define the framework for the development of the free individuals and free market and the companies, but that the state somehow should focus on the most important topic, and this is securing infrastructure, which since a few years we experience, especially after COVID, uh, what this means, if you don't have also the proper resources which you control. Nowadays, I think like in a company, state should focus on those topics which are really relevant in the upcoming 10, 20 years and should really defocus its energy there where it's making a distinction. And this is, again, for me personally, everything around the green transformation because we're living on this burning platform and each day where we do not do something, situation is getting worse. And the second topic, what especially also affects our industry a lot, is everything around artificial intelligence. Um, because if states do not talk to each other here, if states like we currently experience between US and China, Russia and the West, if words are escalating, if there is no desire for finding solutions, if there's a stop of uh, uh, let's say, any kind of connections, of diplomatic connections, of, of, of conversations, then it's getting dangerous. And this is what I think history proved. Mm. Uwe, we have um, these uh, topics, as uh, Andreas mentioned, for example, the green transformation, sustainability. Uh, what is or what should be the role of a state in this very important transformation uh, which we already have? and we will have in the next years? Look, I think coming back to the, to the um, question you asked before, there are clearly many examples where the industry and financial markets are kind of getting annoyed by regulations and by influences that are getting too complex to become operational on a day-to-day -day basis. But fundamentally, I'm with Ricarda here that much of the narrative we have seen in the past has been kind of artificial conflicts. In reality, there's a fundamental interest to work together. And the energy transition is one example. But if you look at, coming back, what have been the major challenges that we have been facing? Let's just look back the last six years, COVID, uh, the general finan the global financial crisis. I guess nobody in the room will disagree 
that uh, the state has been the major rescuer of us in, in these instances, right? For, for a variety of reasons, not everything went right, but this was the fundamental authority at the end of the day we could turn to to get over the crisis. With lots of influence from innovation coming from, from uh, private companies, uh, vaccines and what have you, but, but that was a clear proof point. And if you now look at what are the, the four challenges that I would put in front of us here, which, which are of similar dimension than, than these two, and that's clearly the energy transition, the, the fundamental CO2 crisis that we are facing, then it is the, macro the, the global um, kind of geopolitical situation where just uh, uh, half an hour before we, we, we got an extremely impressive, uh, I think, kind of insight of what that really means. Then there's digitization, and then there is kind of the aging society and what it means to our healthcare system. <coughs> and if I look at energy transition, digitization, let me start with digitization. Also here, I think it's obvious, we need to be very careful that we don't uh, create a society <coughs> with digital literates and illiterates at the end of the day, and, and with losers and winners without massively investing in the education of the workforce going forward to cope with generative AI and what have you. Who would have thought that being a plumber or a gardener is a safer job than being a university-educated accountant or tax advisor, right? Generative uh, AI will make a massive difference here. So, so how do we make sure that this change and innovation is becoming socially cohesive? And that can only work if there is the state providing guardrails and the innovation at the same point in time not being squashed but being encouraged. And on the energy transition coming back, to your question there, I see it exactly in the same way. There's no question that it's the state who needs to set the guardrails with regard to pricing CO2, for example, which is the most important measure to get going uh, and for everyone to orient, uh, orient um, uh, towards. And then there are other kind of regulatory environments that need to be put in place. And then the industry and the capital markets can come up with what I would call catalytic capital to support this transition uh, to the best of their capabilities. That's how it should work. But is it meaningful, for example, if um, the European Union sets um, the rule that mm. um, in 2035 there can not be any more the, tradi the, the traditional cars, the fuel cars, we have uh, to have new cars with renewable energies. Is this um, meaningful if the European Union, for example, sets such a point? Well, I would not just say it's meaningful, but it's very efficient. And in my opinion, it's also necessary. Because if we talk about setting goals, and just yesterday I was talking to company owners of uh, um, uh, Audi in Germany, even the car industry in Germany now is saying, well, we need Planungssicherheit, we say in German. So we need to have security in planning. And we have to have security not just for the next four years, where this government is in power, but for more time. And therefore, I think if we talk about a framework, it's not just setting totally abstract goals. I mean, we can all say the goal is to get climate neutral till 2045. This is something we have done in Germany. But there are so many questions left with that. So when we talk about setting goals, when we talk about setting frameworks, we also need to make clear decisions. And I think at the moment, Europe is facing this with a certain brutality because we see the US, who with the Inflation Reduction Act, have taken money into their hands, have made big investments and also investments and have shown we are clear where the way is leading. We are clear what kind of technologies, what kind of industries we want to have here in the future. If we as Germany, Switzerland, Europe don't have the same clear clarity, but only say, well, we have some certain goals, I think we'll lag behind and not get stronger. But if I might add on one point, which is I think what is really interesting about some points you were making, is that when we talk about the framework the state has to set, we certainly look towards investments, we certainly look towards goals. But for example, now, if you look at the green transformation, if you look at new technologies, renewable energies, in Germany, the biggest obstacle at the moment is missing working force. We don't have enough people that put those things into place. And in this situation, the framework the state has to provide yes. is not just about investments, it's actually about how is our education system working. 
At the moment in Germany, there is thousands of young people that leave school without having any education degree that are lost for this workforce. The question of how we regulate and also enable immigration is a big key question to how we can put forward this working force. And therefore, I think we have to look to it on a bigger spectrum. Framework also means education system, also means societal change, and also means immigration. All those things will be necessary, as necessary maybe even as setting goals like the USU did in the, in the subject. However, my very deep personal conviction is as less state as anyhow possible. You will not be surprised to hear this from my side, right? As less state as anyhow possible. I, I keep on repeating this even after COVID, but and here is the big but, and we discussed this last year also here, the, the state is there to really make tough calls, and it's quite difficult because having deep respect for people such as you who are currently engaged in politics, which is amazing, uh, a amazing challenging topic. But if you talk about just the, the getting out of society, right? If you talk about the topic you mentioned, right, now, Michael, about like this, this car topic, right? Those are super difficult topics for each company because it asks for the concept of, concept of ambit dexterity. On the one hand, the state has to act on a long-term perspective and also on the foresight thinking, okay, what does my country need in 10, 20 years, right? Like in a company. On the other hand, you have currently to please your voters, right? You have currently to provide security, for instance, you yourself to the German population. And this sometimes is a conflict, right? Let me take one example from our country, 2015. I think all of us can think back, big wave of migration coming from the war out of Syria, also to Austria, to Vienna, for instance. We, at that point of time, had a government who, after the first weeks of providing aid, right, they suddenly said, OK, well, population is getting a little bit more, let's say, uh, caring about this topic. We closed the borders, right? Now, for eight years, you hear from our government, we closed the borders, right? We closed the borders. It's very dangerous migration. If you look to the topic here, if you go to the very east of Austria, you look on the borders, frankly spoken, there is no migration. I mean, there is nothing happening there, just a little bit. Since the same period of time, we always said there will be the point of time, and you mentioned it, where we will ask for people who is doing our work. No question if it's Switzerland or Germany or Austria. I think in Switzerland you reached this point of time in 2025, where you have not enough workers for the work to be done. Same in our country. So now all the people in Austria say, oh, we need migration. But just this migration, what we would like to have, meaning the good migration. Question, by the way, what is the good migration, right? So we lost a lot of time. And this, for instance, would have been a task of the Austrian government setting a frame 10 years ago because the demographic change in Austria didn't come by its sudden. It was foreseeable. We talked to our company about it, how we deal with this problem, right? But here's something where I expect that the state is thinking at least five to 20 years ahead. If I might add one point, because I think also, like I said before, sometimes we have some artificial debates. I think also if you debate about the role of the state, where I would say states need to play a bigger role and are doing it at the moment, this does not mean states don't need to get more efficient and faster. Oh, yeah. And we also I talk agree. about regulation there, because, for example, I think there are some very good texts from Mariana Mazzucato, where she's talking about private-public partnerships. <laughs> I see some <laughs> depressed faces within the, the, the audience, where she's talking about private-public pu pu partnership, where the problem of the public part sometimes getting the lesser end is also because they are not a very attractive workplace, they are very, very slow sometimes, and therefore they can't hold up. And so I think we need to ta also talk about, and this is our part then, less bureaucracy is something every politician tells at every panel of the world. <laughs> so it's probably sometimes an empty promise, but it <laughs> is also a question of how efficient we are, how we can hold our own in public partnerships, and how our role will also play out geopolitically. Because I'm sorry, because I have to repeat myself, and we had this discussion before and as <laughs> it's well. Fine, it's fine. So you need to listen to it again. <laughs> last year, or not, just, not even last year, a few months ago, there was the Munich Security Conference, and there was a talk about um, resources, critical resources. Everyone was talking about how we can do this value based and with more environmental laws and everything. And then there was the foreign minister of Togo. And he listened to everything, and then he said, well, this all sounds very good. And on your value basis, I wholeheartedly agree with you. But I have the problem 
of a country with a lot of poverty and with a not so strong industry, so I need to get more industry, more infrastructure. When I want to build a port and I don't have the means myself, and the ambassador of China hears about this, two months later, there are workers from China, four months later, there are, there's the port. In the same time of those four months, I've written a text or a letter to Brussels and there has not even been an answer. Because at the moment, the European Union is very bureaucratic, it is very slow, and this leads to us playing a lesser role in the global south, leads to us losing meaning and leads to us lacking behind. So I think this is our homework as well as the state. We will open now. We will open now the question to the audience, and I also have a question if it's possible that we can have a bit water here on the stage, and then we <laughs> go to the audience. Um, yes, there's a young leader asking us. Maybe you can stand up, then they see you. Yes, and then there will be a microphone, I think. Yes, it's Hi. coming. Can you tell us, please, your name and... Hi, I'm Isabel. I'm from the UK, and I study political economy of Europe at the LSE. And my question is the following. The message over the last two days has been about the absolute necessity of cooperation and collaboration in order to face the biggest problems of today, including climate change. Should we be seriously worried about this shift to intervention even protectionism, might it impede the move to net zero on a global scale? Climate change is a global problem, after all. Um, look, that is uh, a very good question oh. and uh, an area of big concern. This kind of bifurcation that we are currently seeing developing between China and the US and Europe kind of caught in between has, uh, is starting to induce a lot of collateral damage with regard to innovation and the ability of capital to move around and to be placed in, in areas where uh, most innovation is happening and best returns can be gained. Um, there's protectionism which ha happens in an obvious way so that uh, um, governments are preventing investments to be made in their country or preventing uh, companies that happen to reside in uh, the territory over which the government has jurisdiction to invest in other countries. And there's more subtle kind of um, uh, intervention happening in the sense of CFIUS or other regulations where it's becoming more and more difficult to be on a level playing field for, for investors coming from different regions. Some of this is unintended. But some of this is simply a result out of the bifurcation scenario that we are seeing playing out. You are absolutely right that it is most felt with regard to problems that are global. And uh, the climate change is the most pressing one in that regard. If the world would evolve in a situation where the best and most efficient solar panels are only available in a certain region because of that protectionism, then this is a bad place to be. So this is something that we need to fight collectively going forward, both on the political front, but also on the investor front, and continuously make the argument that those global problems can only be addressed if a reasonable amount of international cooperation, the free flow of human capital and financial capital remains to be a given. Otherwise, we are in trouble. Like adding to what Uwe said, uh, you know, the, the, the European insurance industry somehow represents the largest investor in Europe, something like 11 trillion euro. So it's super important for the green transformation where this capital is flowing to. And we had a large discussion, I may say, that even Switzerland here, because some relevant, really big relevant European insurance companies say, why should we follow this green transformation? Why we shift, why we should, should, should shift our assets towards green? if our competitors maybe in Asia or US do not do this. And then we clearly said, okay, we have to start. We have to go ahead. We have to, we have to be the front runner. Because if we do not do this, the world 
is not waiting, and the fight against climate change is not waiting. And see what happened, right? That, and this is also a kind of, of match of discussion between investors, the, the movement of the capital and um, financial companies such as insurances. Suddenly, investors also say, OK, why you do not move more into, uh, let's say, green infrastructure, whatever, OK? So we keep on asking for a proper taxonomy, saying, please, European Union, give us a clear taxonomy, what is really green and what net, not because the worst thing what might happen is we all invest, we tell you as our clients, well, this is a super clean product, let's say, any kind of life insurance. And after 10 years, you find out this is absolutely not green, but greenwashing. But clear statement, and don't be surprised from my European function here, saying Europe has to go ahead and, and maybe take some time till other parts of the world will be following. If I might add two thoughts, one on the US and one on China. We have had a big discussion in Germany about the return of protectionism concerning the Inflation Reduction Act. Is it protectionism? What does it mean for us? And I have to say, I feel a certain ambivalence towards it. Because on the one hand, it means for many companies within Europe, they're telling us, well, this is a key factor to invest in the US and not within Germany, not within Europe. And it has some protectionist tendencies. I would totally say this. And on the other hand, what we are experiencing at the moment is not like we have experienced a lot of times before, a race to the bottom, so who has the lowest standards, but the race to the top. Who is able to get new technologies, renewable energies, green jobs towards their country? And so I think if we look at towards the Inflation Reduction Act, we can have a big discussion, is it protectionism, is it bad or anything? But to be rather honest, it's going to stay in place because Joe Biden has an election towards, coming towards him against Trump, so he's going to do everything to win this, also with the Inflation Reduction Act. So I think as Europe, we need to let, think less about, well, what can we hold against it, but really, in this race to the top, what is our role? What are our strengths? How can we strengthen those strengths? How can we use what we have? I think it's about cheap energy from renewables. We're also talking about an industry, electric um, price at the moment within Germany. It's about having a working force. It's about getting faster. But I think this really, uh, it's a chance, but at the same time, it is also signaling towards some difficult tendencies worldwide. And uh, yeah. So Ricardo, if, if I may, there's, there's I think, um, a clearly a debate about the protectionist uh, nature of IRR, but there's something to be learned as well from a European perspective. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who have looked more closely into how IRI is constructed, you will have noticed versus the European programs that the fundamental difference between the two is that European programs, the Green Deal, Fit for 55, are basically trying to prescribe technology that is then being funded and supported, versus the IRI is completely technology agnostic. It's basically a tax relief for whatever you can, can come up with and let the market decide what the technology is most, most competitive. And there's a subtle change, difference, not so subtle, I would say, there's a difference in philosophy. What should the, the state is not in the, we talked about the type of regulation which is conducive, and I would say uh, in very rare occasions, the Obama administration figured that out the hard way when they were trying to back specific solar companies in the US which then failed. So very rarely, can a state entity, be it the European Union or a local government, be successful in picking the right technology? The market is the best source for to do so. But creating an environment in which kind of technologies that target the energy transition can flourish, that's the right thing to do. And IRI is doing that pretty smartly. So we go back to the questions from the yeah, audience. Yes, Here's sorry, a question sorry. in the front row, right? Yeah, you can stand up and then the microphone is coming. I'm not so. a young leader, but... Yes. Hein <laughs> Reichenberger, so I'm a, I'm a counselor of the schmidt heine Foundation and a professor at the University of Fribourg. So now you talk, talked a lot to us about uh, government intervention. We need a lot of government intervention, of course, because markets fail almost all the time. But before we had also talk about government intervention. Eh? Russian government intervention in Ukraine. And nobody thinks that's a good intervention. So I think you should talk not about government intervention, we need it, but how government should be structured in order to make good interventions. And 
as you know, markets fail, or you said it more or less, markets fail. Therefore, we need government intervention. And of course, government or the polity is nothing else than the market for political services. And if the market fails, of course, also politics fails, except if you have really good rules, the, the, yeah, the, the rules of the game, and only then politics can work. Therefore, I would like to hear from you something about what you think and how you think that politics should be reformed in order to be able to make good interventions. Because as I said, we have seen, usually when you look to the world, government interventions are bad. But of course, we know there could be good interventions, but we need institutions for it. And what's about these institutions? Yeah, has somebody an idea? <laughs> To answer the question. <laughs> yeah, sure. It's not the most easiest one. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, first of all, I think I would not agree with the comparison, just taking one broad term of intervention and now comparing what IIA or some industry politics is doing to what Russia is doing at the moment. But I think we probably agree on that. But like I talked about before, I think. On the one hand, we need to get faster. We are rather slow. I don't really have the comparison to Switzerland, so um, if it's the same, but I think there's Even also a slower. very international audience. But I think for Germany, we are at the moment rather slow. I think secondly, there is this saying, there is no glory in prevention, which is very, very true for when you have to win voters, but which is very, very bad for how we do politics. Because normally, and I don't want to speak myself free of this, we think in a time periods of four years. Because everybody knows in four years we want to be re-elected, we want to be part of government again. So there are many cases where you make decisions that nowadays are not very popular, but they are very, very important in 10 years, but they are not being made because we want to be re-elected in four years. I would say it has even gotten sometimes a little bit worse because at the moment it's not even like in four years, but I think in Germany there has been kind of a disease of polls where there's a new poll every single day where it's even like week for week for week for week how we get a new signal, a new signal, a new signal. And I think therefore this is something, it's not easy to change because you need to, it's like I'm a bad party leader if my party loses all the elections. <laughs> so, but I think it's something that we have to have a discussion about of how to work, really to work on a more like time frame where we say, where do we need to be in 15 years? Where do we need in 10, 20 years? And what are the prescriptions, the prepositions for that? And I think the third point would be, and it's maybe a little bit of a disagreement with you when we're talking about technology, I don't know so much, but a more strategic politics, especially when we're looking on the European Union at the moment. Because um, I think it's not about saying this technology is bad, this is good, and this is good, and this is bad. But I think what we have been lacking in the past has been a strategic outlook. What do we have to need here? What kind of critical industries are necessary for our security, for our survival, for our economy? And this strategic debate has not been taking place within Europe, mm. I think, for many, many years. And we have seen the repercussions mm. of that. So I would say this is something, yeah, faster, more, more preventional and um, uh, more strategic. And there are also these discussions now in Brussels, in the, in the Commission, with the critical infrastructure. So with the war in Ukraine, they have this new meaning also and this new strategic, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, Andreas, and then we go a back short, to the yeah, audience. Yeah, yeah, a short sure. one sentence. I did not ask whether we should make better or worse politics, but the question was how to guarantee that politics is becoming better. And you only said we should make good politics, but that's absolutely trivial. <laughs> Okay, I, I may step in because, Ricardo, I think it's difficult for you to defend yourself. <laughs> now, frankly spoken, I, I think Maybe I didn't understand the question. No, you don't so It's okay. We go to I, Andreas. I do not say it's... I wouldn't say it's trivial. I think, again, I repeat it. I, I'm, not, I'm not supporting the Greens, right? But, however, I just say that... that Would be okay. No, because I think green is something self-going and it's deep inside of ourselves, should be in the meantime. But what I want to say is... It's a super balance. It's a super difficult balance at the moment, and I have deep respect for everyone being acting currently in European policy. 
What I do not like is the blaming of the European Union, because we choose it ourselves. Germany, I mean, except Switzerland, most of us who are members in Spain, whatever, in Italy, in whatever, we are part of the European Union, we can shape it. It's like if you're a CEO in a company, you're a member of the board, you're B minus one, you say it's a bad company, then do something against it. But what I want to say is, in the... In in, we, we heard a lot about leadership the last years here, amazing programs, right? And this is, we had a chancellor in Austria, Sebastian Kurz, who was an amazing speaker. He really could talk. He just, yeah. frankly spoken, and he was once working for our company, so we know him quite well. He just, at the end of his career, lacked the content. So the question is, what is, what is this government standing for? What is the long-term vision? So I try to repeat on your or reply on your question about what is good policy. And in our company, and some board members here uh, can uh, hopefully confirm this, we think not from a quarter to quarter. We think about one thing. When I leave the company, whenever it will be a CEO, I want to hand over this company to my successor in a better way, in a better condition as I found it when I became CEO. This is the only thing, and it somehow corresponds to the human narrative saying we should all hand over this world in a better shape then we received it from our parents or grandparents. At least this is the narrative, right? So to answer your question, I think the only chance is that you think long-term as politicians, but here is the but, this has one negative consensus, you will be not re-elected. And this brings me to the question, should like in a company, you have certain limits, periods, like we have for certain key functions, I do not know in Switzerland, but in US, for instance, also in Austria, right? We heard yesterday Mr. Brecht, amazing, Sorry, one, one last comment. Okay. And he said, if we are not successful in fighting the climate change as whole world, as global leaders, we have in most of our countries, in the latest 15 years, governments who we, all of us will not like because they will be like kind of dictatorships, right? Because then you have migration waves and you, if, if we have no answer to this, we are lost, yeah? So, sorry, also maybe this will not please you, but one thing is I expect from a politics being long-term thinking, and second, even if the price would, Ricardo would have to base that maybe you're not re-elected next time, but then you come back in eight years again, whatever, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a young politician. <laughs> yeah, young politician. Uh, we go back to the audience questions and we take a young one, a young leader. You can stand up, please. Tell us your name, where are you from? Hi, um, hi, my name is Saskia. I am uh, from Germany, but studying at the University of Oxford, studying environmental change and management. And so uh, in Germany, we have a big problem of nimbyism, uh, not in my backyard kind of attitude. And I think in this room and across the symposium, we have a little bit of a problem with CEO nimbyism towards net zero. So kind of picking up on what Andreas has said, Net zero, transition, very important, but perhaps not going to happen in my CEO tenureship. And I was wondering to all of you, specifically to Ricardo, what the role of regulation is in bringing corporations, not just regarding the energy, we talk a lot about energy, mm -hmm. but in the other spheres towards net zero, and maybe Andreas and Uwe as well, if you see other mechanisms in the governance landscape in the markets that are important for really pushing towards making transition plans robust now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I actually did not know of this short term for not my backyard, but I love it. So I'm going to use it a lot of times now because I think this is showing something. I was talking about goals beforehand. And I think we have seen in Germany, we see it in this year, and it's rather difficult, especially for us as the Green Party, I think for the whole government, it is rather easy to set goals. Every democratic party within Germany has said, we agree on net neutrality, zero, network, uh, zero and CO2 emissions until 2045. But now we come to the question, what measurements do we need on the way there? And suddenly, there is a lot of, this cannot work, this cannot work, this cannot work. I would wish, and I think this is first to politics, and I'm going to talk about the companies. I think Bernd Ulrich, uh, journalist alike a lot, has once said there needs to be a rule where when you say, when we talk about climate politics, that this doesn't work, you need to name an alternative. Because there is not one golden way. You can do it with more investments, you can do it with more price taxes, you can do it with more rules. But I think when we have a situation where everybody is just naming what is not working, then everybody can say we agree on the goal, but the goal is meaningless. The goal at the moment is not bringing down C2 emissions. It's measures that needs to be taken. And I think when we talk about what we can do with companies, first of all, it's about pricing. 
We have the um, certificate handle, so the ETS on a European level. So the real prices need to be shown. We have a lot of externalization within the past when it came to pricing. And second of all, there need to be rules in certain areas. We were talking about the European Union beforehand, which also say, well, your business model is not working if it is not based on also climate protection, if it is not based on sustainability. So I think we need to have an environment where different business models can work, but where those that don't take to those values simply will not work anymore. And third of all, I think in the moments we are also working with subsidies. These need to be connected to certain goals. Yep. At the moment within Germany, I said this before, we have the debate about having an industry energy price. So uh, cupping the energy prices for the industry. We as a Green Party, which might be surprising for some people, say yes, we need this. Because we have a situation where certain industries might leave the country in the next years coming until we have renewable energies that are cheap enough and there's a lot of them. But I think what we cannot do is just give out subsidies as a state without holding the ones getting them responsible. So we say we have an industry energy price, but the companies using this need to have transition plans that don't just include plans, but really include measures. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Look, three comments. First of all, don't underestimate the power of the market here. So think about how difficult it is for a business to get financing that is not in a believable, authentic, and measurable way on its way to net zero today. So this is just a matter of fact. So you end up with stranded assets or stranded business models and you will be punished by the markets for it. The problem statement is no longer in question. So that's number one. Number two, there's a fundamental rule in business, only what's been measured gets done, which means that there is a massive push from a reporting perspective to make it absolutely clear on which state, which state of the journey towards net zero, net zero a specific company is. So the times where you could hide that or you would, could hope or point the shareholders to another day in the future, this is gone. And thirdly, just to give you an example of what a fund like Temasek is doing, we have about 400 billion assets under management with a pretty large portfolio, as you can imagine. As a fund, we are net zero today. And we have put clear goals in, in front of us that by 2030, 50% of CO2 reduction has to happen in the whole portfolio. And by 2050, it has to be the whole portfolio has to be net zero. That's good. Now, if you have companies in the portfolio like Singapore Airlines, for example, um, that is an interesting task in front of us. So what do you do from a technology perspective to encourage the company and to help the transition to happen? It has to do a lot with technology investments and innovation. But if taken seriously, if you're not ju ju just, you could as a fund just walk away from it and invest, in, invest into something that is green already today. But where the real hard work likes, lies is the hard to abate area, steel, cement, uh, transportation, to put innovation into play and technology to make this transition happening. And you will see it is happening. So we're discussing here the return of the state, the shift in paradigm, and we have time for a last question. And I saw before there, I think, yes, a question, someone holding the hand every time. <laughs> so we give you the, it's, the very back okay, back. it's someone else. Sorry, it's fine. No, no, it's fine. <laughs> Uh, hello, thank you for all these insights. Uh, my name is Florian Gasser. I uh, finished my PhD this week in this building. And I have a question. Congratulations. Uh, <laughs> um, we had, we heard before in the previous speech that we have to defend our democracy. But sometimes I have the feeling we are selling our democracy. When it comes to critical infrastructure in various uh, countries, we see that we sell them for, yeah, for short termism. It sounds like a good price. But when you think about it a little bit longer, this could be a big problem in the future. Also because we sell it to states who love silk, for example, and we have then to focus in the future if this is the right way, especially because we will need maybe uh, more than 50% of this critical uh, infrastructure in the future and have to decide on our own when it's, there's a time maybe we don't have everywhere friends and we have to 
have to defend our democracy. And that's what I want to ask. And uh, what do you think, how can we handle this situation? I know because in the short term, it always looks good to have high numbers, to sell parts of it, 10%, 20, 30, 40, 50, 51. But this could be an issue. So thank you for answering that. We have... Oh, oh, oh. Congratulations to you, what's your PhD, and this is a very important question. I was talking about beforehand how we, especially in Germany, have faced the repercussions of dependency on Russia. We have always said it's not political, not we as a whole, but especially a great coalition that was in power throughout the last 16 years with a short period of time, and it was always non-political. And somehow it reminds me of some debates we have at the moment about China, because now we're talking about the port in, ha in Hamburg, and I hear again, it's non-political to sell parts of it to China. When we look towards China, there is no non-political. There is, a, especially, there's going to be, I'm not talking, we have the discussion, the coupling is not the right answer. Of course it's not. I don't know anybody who thinks the coupling of China is in any way possible, necessary, or makes sense. But there is a question about how we support and also protect our critical infrastructure, because China is always looking towards these situations on a political level. They are seeing it as a political thing. They are seeing an investment that's going to weaken Europe, that's going to weaken, in this case, Germany, and that is going to give them more influence. So I think the negativity we had towards Russia, we cannot repeat with China. We need to support and also protect our critical infrastructure. And for me personally, this means we should not sell the port in Hamburg towards China. This is a good last <laughs> statement. Thank you very much, <laughs> Ricardo Dallang, Andreas Brandstetter, Professor Uwe Krüger. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you in the audience. Uh, just give me two minutes more, and then I will let you go to the coffee break. On May uh, 3rd, there was the annual study published, Voices of Leaders of Tomorrow, and I will give you uh, two insights of this really interesting uh, report. Uh, both generations, the leaders of tomorrow and the leaders of today, were asked about uh, stricter rules um, in the env environmental change, also in the uh, for the states, and 90% uh, of the leaders of today agreed that we need more stricter rules, 69% of the leaders of tomorrow. And another finding, and this is interesting also because of our discussion we had here, when they were asked about the main difficult to sustainable change was the answer, the political system. So this was on the top of the list for both generations, the leaders of today, leaders of tomorrow, political system. So we have to work on that. And we will um, do that. And we will report and discuss this, of course. So if you are interested in these findings, findings, you will find um, this report. And now you can go, or you will have a short coffee break until 4 o'clock. Then there will be another session block um, in the main building, here in the aula and in the square. Thank you very much. I wish you a lovely afternoon. <laughs> Goodbye.